Hello and welcome to History Bite, and today we're looking at the Battle of the Nile, Nelson's famous naval victory against Napoleon's French fleet in Abu Bay in 1798. In the year 1798, Napoleon's victories were in full flow. His recent victories in northern Italy over the Austrian Empire had helped to secure victory for the French in the War of the First Coalition in 1797, and Great Britain remained the only major power still at war with France. The British knew that Napoleon was going to launch a new expedition to try and cut off British trade, but they didn't know where, and they had to find out exactly what destination Napoleon had in mind. Napoleon had chosen Egypt because he knew it would be a strategic location from which to launch attacks on British India. To find and stop Napoleon's expedition, the Royal Navy entrusted Rear Admiral Horatio Nelson to do so. He was a rising star in the Navy, but as yet still relatively inexperienced in command. Nelson tracked Napoleon to Egypt, but couldn't find the French fleet. However, on the 1st of August 1798, he discovered the fleet in Abu Kir Bay, so the time for action was at hand. But how did the battle pan out? French Admiral Bruys had chosen to anchor in Abu Kir Bay because it held strategic defensive value. The bay was enclosed, so the French had anchored in a defensive line of battle, with shallow water and shoals to the head and rear of the line. The French believed that the shallows inland would prevent the Royal Navy trying to squeeze around behind the line, as the water was only four fathoms deep, less than eight metres. They had positioned gunships near the head of the line for extra defence. Therefore, even if Nelson was brave enough to attack such a position, the French believed the attack would come from the centre of the line, so Bruis had positioned his flagship, Lorient, in the centre, with the heavier ships in the centre and rear. And the French were confident because they outgunned the English. The Royal Navy was sailing with mostly 74-gun ships of the line, 14 of them, while the French had nine 74-gun ships, three 80-gun ships, and the Lorient itself, which sported an immense 120 guns. A more cautious commander might have trepidations about sailing into unfamiliar territory with more heavily armed ships facing him in a defensive position, as well as the shores that could catch you off guard and ground your ship while under enemy fire. But Nelson was not one to shy from a fight and ordered an immediate attack on the line. Nelson had formulated a plan and taken into account a difficult wind had ordered a ship-on-ship -ship action on the north side of the French line with each English ship sailing up close and anchoring next to a target. The French sighted the British at 2pm, and Bruys confidently gave orders to ready the ships. However, as the British rounded Abu Kir Island and came into the bay, they were quick to discover the French mistake. The French ship Gourier had left about a mile between its bow and the shoals, so a carefully commanded man of war might be able to slip through the gap. The British approached in a line, but were not exposed to much damage due to poor French gunnery. The British ship Culloden ran aground, and the rear ships stayed to help try to pull her off the bank, while the leading ship Goliath, led by Captain Thomas Foley, commenced action at 6.15pm. He noticed the gap between Gourier and the shoals, and decided to take advantage and adapt Nelson's plan by leading the ships to landward of the French line. The French had expected Goliath to swing around the starboard side, but Foley had correctly judged that the French were unprepared on their port side. As he passed in front, he gave raking fire to great effect. The Goliath was followed down the landward side by the Zealous, the Orion, the Theseus and the Audacious, who all raked Guerriere as they passed. The first commander to actually follow the original plan was Nelson himself in the vanguard, who dropped anchor next to the third ship, Spartiate. Seeing that Nelson was already engaging that ship, the Theseus moved on to engage L'Aquion, while the Orion opened fire on Le People Sauvien. The Bellerophon drew the short straw and ended up alongside L'Orient, which had almost 50 cannons more than her. She was battered and ended up dismasted, with 200 men killed or wounded. Eventually her cable was cut and she drifted out of the action. The Majestic also faced a similar barrage from Le Hero, and her captain was killed. She got clear and found an easier target in the next ship. Because of being surrounded, the Conquerant was the first to surrender, followed by the People Sovereign, who had lost her anchor and had begun drifting south out of the action. Fighting continued fiercely, and it was after 8pm that the Alexander and the Swiftshore arrived, followed by the Leander. It was the Leander that the fictional captain Jack Aubrey of Master and Commander fame was meant to have been on as a midshipman. Together, these three fresh ships made for Lorient, and the Alexander cut in behind her to create a sandwich attack. 
In the battle, Bruis himself had his leg shot off and eventually died on the quarterdeck. But even before then, Lorient had caught fire on her poop deck. The firefighting efforts were in vain, and so seeing that it might blow up, the ships behind cut their anchors to get clear. They drifted south and got stranded on the coast. The fighting went on brutally into the night until around 10pm when the fire on the Lorient had reached the magazine and she exploded with such force that it killed 1,010 men on board. Many of Napoleon's treasures from his conquest of Malta sank to the bottom. This was the climax of the battle as the remaining French ships realised the fight was over. Two of the rear ships managed to escape while the rest either surrendered or destroyed themselves. Victory for the English had been assured. This was a huge victory for Nelson and a massive morale boost for the English Royal Navy who had sabotaged Napoleon's plans in Egypt. There were loads of consequences that came out of this battle that would have effects for the rest of the war. Out of the 13 French ships that were moored in Abaco Bay, only two managed to escape back to French control. Nelson became lauded as a hero. This had been the most decisive Royal Navy victory to date and Nelson was granted an annual pension of 2,000 a year by Parliament. He even received a £10,000 one-off payment from the East India Company for potentially saving them against Napoleon's threats. However, during the battle, Nelson had taken a heavy blow to the head above his bad eye. A flap of skin had opened and the blood had temporarily blinded his good eye. He shouted, I am killed, remember me to my wife, before being taken for medical aid. He would suffer headaches for the rest of his life. But perhaps the biggest consequence was that Napoleon was now stranded without his fleet in Egypt and it wouldn't be long before he'd go back to France and abandon his Egyptian campaign. Nelson had now shown his prowess and strategic brilliance and would go on to even greater success against the French in the years to come. If you enjoyed this video and would like to find out more about history, why not subscribe to our channel or follow us on Twitter or Facebook?